Here we are. So can everybody see this beautiful picture of the desert that now is a metaphor for my campus Ethernet uh, connection as well? <laughs> so thank you all so much for your patience with that. And I see uh, Allison puts it here, Murphy's Law, absolutely. Um, so I am pleased to have the opportunity uh, to demonstrate to you the necessity of having Plan B. Uh, so thank you, Verizon Hotspot. Uh, and here we are again. Um, and if this was the worst thing to happen to our campus internet in the last week, I would be happy, but unfortunately it's not. So here we are, right? But I think appropriate to transition back into uh, the, the point I was trying to make here is, you know, when we're making decisions based in fear, right? Based in this loss of control, uh, which yeah, I just demonstrated for you, we begin to hoard things. We begin to, to try to take back things that we see as scarce because we want at least that, that illusion of control, right? And so I, I, I saw this happen a lot. Uh, and I felt myself uh, doing this as well, by the way, lest you think that I'm just condemning others and, and not implicating myself in this. Uh, I, you know, I, like I said, I'm an experienced online teacher, uh, but I was teaching face-to-face -face classes. Um, and, you know, I was really enjoy, I was working with an academic skills class for at-risk first-year students, which is a class I really enjoy teaching because I too was an at-risk first-year student. Uh, and, you know, now we had to shift it online. And for me, it was like, you know, it ruined everything I wanted to do, right? Because we were really cruising as, as a good, you know, face-to-face -face seminar. Uh, so what kind of decisions was I making? Uh, what was I doing, right? Yet we are trying in higher education uh, to do the exact opposite of those things. We are trying to educate students, even if we don't identify in our institutions with a liberal arts ethos. Uh, I think higher education in the United States still it embraces at least some of the core tenets of you know, what has been referred to as a liberal arts education. Certainly as, as articulated here by Vem Vivel, who is the, uh, the president, I believe, of Lewis and Clark College uh, in Oregon. Uh, and and in, a, in a recent article earlier this year where he talked about, you know, what are the things that a liberal arts education and by extension U.S. higher education, what are the things that it can do that will help provide an antidote for the problems with which we are wrestling with as a society today? So students, he said, who pursue the liberal arts are, are committed to doing these things, right? The things that we always talk about that students should be able to do in higher education. Collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, the three C's, right? Here are the things that students value. Uh, but what I really was struck by uh, from, from this quote is where Vivo talks about, you know, it gives them the competencies, the abilities, and impact the imperatives to look, think, and act beyond their own selves, beyond their own self-interest the qualities that we are after when higher education is functioning at its best are compelling our students to look, think, and act beyond self-interest, and us too. And that's something we need to grab onto. Uh, I think, you know, cur our current moment has showed us this now more than ever, the urgency of this, right? So we have to be very careful. You know, are we making decisions from a place of fear? Are we reacting to a sense that things are circling the drain? And unless I make a bold decision and do so quickly and emphatically with no looking back, am I going to go down the drain too? Are we making decisions from a place of fear or from a place of hope? Because even pre-COVID, it was very easy for us in higher education to be making decisions and reacting from a place of fear. Because look at what the discourse around higher education is telling everybody, including us in American society, that college is only good when it's disrupted or unbound. Let's break it apart. You know, we need to innovate, 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 and nothing that we do now is worth keeping. The dead hand of the past needs to, to be pushed aside. In fact, parents, why are you even sending your kids to college? What kind of waste of time and resources is this, right? The students get to college and they're just coddled because they're snowflakes and they're entitled and they're going to fail. And this is a generation that can't handle adversity. That's what the discourse is saying, right? Even allegedly serious academics 
write books with titles like The Dumbest Generation? Are we making decisions from a place of fear? Do things not look exactly as we would have them look? And so is this how we now view our work in higher education? How do we not act from a place of fear, given all of that in the background and COVID, which has disrupted, whether we like it or not, the status quo in American higher education? Well, I would suggest that the antidote to our fears in this current moment is a creation of community. And community, again, and beyond just the superficial sense. We talk, you know, we use the word community a lot. It shows up a lot in mission statements and strategic plans and other corporate sounding documents that talk about, you know, our purpose and our mission in very sort of gauzy, you know, ethereal, airy terms. But what I mean is a community rooted in this practice of hope or praxis, as Freire would have us think. How do our practices and the ethic in which those practices are rooted? create a community operating from hope, because that is what our students need and need from us now more than ever. And so I think of community in higher education in much the same way that the writer and feminist theorist Bell Hooks articulates it in her book, Teaching Community. Community, Hooks says, is a place that is life-sustaining and mind-expanding. A place, and this is a wonderful phrase of hers that I love, a place of liberating mutuality where teacher and student together work in partnership. And what really sticks out for me in that statement is, you know, this is what it's about, right? Like if you were to ask almost any college faculty member invested in teaching and learning, you know, what is your dream classroom look like, right? What does that dream class look like? You would get language and concepts that very much align, I think, with what Hooks is talking about here with community, liberating mutuality not stifling hierarchical authority, where teacher and student are working together in partnership. Now, someone might say, oh, you know, that's, you know, that's the equivalent of all everyone sitting in a circle and singing kumbaya, but by God, in my class, we are serious scholars who are doing serious learning. I think, you know, what Hooks is after here is the fact that, you know, teacher and student, you know, those are roles. We are at different places on our journey, right? Whether it's in terms of the disciplinary content or cognition and learning and all of the other things, but we are involved as partners in a mutual enterprise, even if we are at different places along the spectrum or along the pathway in that enterprise. And keeping that connection, you know, we are in it together. Our roles may be different. We may be engaging with this learning space differently, but we are still in the same community of practice. And that's where I think we can sit even in, and in fact, especially in the challenging times that we now face. Because the alternative is no longer sustainable. How many of our students are experiencing higher education, whether it was before or after our turn from COVID? How many of our students are experiencing college this way? How many of our students are finding themselves occupying a landscape, both figuratively and literally, that is strewn with obstacles, where doors are closed in their face and not open, where they are not centered, but rather pushed to the margins? How many of our students are experiencing college this way? I would suggest that if we look at things like six-year graduation rates, for example, we can see in terms of the attrition the lowering rates of persistence and completion, that many of our students are indeed experiencing college this way. And if we break that data down, for example, with correlation to race or socioeconomic status, or in fact, put those two figures together in your analysis, the reality becomes even more stark. We are not serving all of our students equally, and we are not serving our students equitably. But when students come to us, our institution, we are making them a promise, either implicitly or ex explicitly, and often both, right? We are telling a student, when you come to our university, you have the opportunity to pursue success as you define it and conceive it. And for many students, that's a degree and a ticket to the next chapter in their life, because that's what they've been told is important. 
but they come to us with that, right? We are telling them, this is how you will succeed, that you will have the resources, the expertise, the facilities, and the support here. You do your part and we will do our part. But for how many of our students is that promise asymmetrical or is it broken? Again, if we look at some of the demographic differences in graduation rates or persistence of completion rates or the rates of completions of programs in certain disciplines, we are not serving all of our students equitably. The promise is an illusion for some. And what that tells me is that we can talk about access to education all we want. And I believe in access to education. I think it's important. But the real question is, what are we giving access to? Access to overcrowded classrooms, access to four students in a dorm room that was built for two, access to programs that are marginalizing students, access to a campus culture where there is a hostile racial climate in some areas, that, that access becomes more of a cruel joke than an empowering agency. And so I think we need to be thinking very carefully about all of our, you know, our campus as a community. Because what is in operation in higher education? Uh, and this is a phrase that many of you might be familiar with. You know, the hidden curriculum is a thing, right? And so what, it, you know, we have a formal curriculum. You know, here's the syllabus for your class, right? Here, here are the requirements for your major. Here's how many hours you need to take uh, of prerequisites in order to be admitted into the pre-med program, right? We have the formal curriculum. Here are the textbooks you're going to read for class. But the hidden curriculum in higher education or in education in general is extraordinarily, in fact, even more powerful. And so the hidden curriculum are the incidental lessons that are learned by students about things like power and knowledge and who has it and who doesn't and whose knowledge is valued and whose isn't and whose voice is heard and whose isn't. And so I want to be very clear here. Our students are always learning. Learning. Our entire campuses, whether we're talking about the literal physical campus or the virtual campus that our students are also inhabiting. And in these times, a blend of both, right? The entire campus is a teaching and learning space. Our students are always learning. They are learning in Econ 101, in the business building, in room 12 from 1 to 150 every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. But they are also learning in the dining hall. They are also learning in the registrar's office. They are learning in the bursar's and financial aid office. Students are learning when they look at the custodial and cleaning staff at a university and what kind of uh, ethnic and racial groups make up the disproportionate amount of service staff and how that staff is treated by the institution. Students are learning about who matters and who doesn't and whose voice is heard and whose isn't. That's just one example. We know from research that instructors, regardless of gender identification, race, and uh, point in their career, from new instructors all the way up to senior instructors, that overall, almost every college instructor by the averages calls on men more than women in class discussions. We know that male students interrupt more and are not called to account for it than female students. We don't even know this in many ways, right? But what are our students learning, even if it's a lesson we did not intend to teach? That is the hidden curriculum. It is powerful. It is a thing. And so one of the things that I'd like to suggest that if we talk about how do we create a community of hope within our institution, within our campus community in these times, is we have to be very attentive to what we are saying to our students. And I'm using the word saying in a very broad sort of sense because we know there are significant barriers to student success. Uh, all of us, I think, have encountered students who have not succeeded either in our individual class, or maybe they dropped out of our program or our major, or maybe we've had advisees or students who've, who've stopped out entirely, who dropped out of college, period. And so I want you to think for a second about you know, maybe some experiences or students that, that you knew who are in that particular place. And think about what are the barriers that you see to student success or that you have seen or that students have told you about? 
what are some of the principal barriers that you see? So go ahead and put your, put your observations here in the chat window again. Yeah, poor internet connection. <laughs> that is a significant issue. The digital divide is a thing, absolutely. Uh, competing obligations, procrastination, balancing obligations, you know, I think uh, uh, emotional difficulties, lack of a place to live. Housing and food insecurity are significant issues for far more students than we think. In fact, about 50% of college students, some of the latest research from the Hope Center uh, for Community and Justice at Temple University in Philadelphia, uh, they did a survey about two years ago. Uh, and the data was pretty consistent from two-year schools to Votech schools to four-year colleges to private universities, the whole spectrum. About 50% of students in those institutions, no matter which type, reported that what once within the last week, at least, they had not known where their next meal was coming from that they had experienced food insecurity. So yeah, these are things. And then there's those other things that go in the academic toolbox, right? Study skills, time management. For our first generation students, as several of you have identified here in the chat, these are particularly important issues, right? One of the things that higher education needs to really grapple with is that we have students coming to us you know, that are basically being rewarded or punished based on the cultural capital that they bring with them, you know. And we've all heard quoted, you know, the studies that say the primary determinant about how successful one is monetarily in life is the zip code in which they were born. And I don't know if that's 100% true, but the fact that that's even in the conversation is pretty important, right? So I'm seeing uh, Gregory puts in here that you have a food bank on campus and that most of the graduate students, you know, relied on it heavily pre-COVID. Uh, we have a food bank, a mobile food bank come to my campus here in the heart of Des Moines, Iowa, the state capital, twice a month. Uh, and students, including some of the small number of our graduate students, uh, are using that as well. When I was in graduate school, I sold plasma to pay rent, right? So when we have things that are occurring like that, that we don't feel, you know, how are students supposed to, as Bethany puts it, you know, how do they, how are we supposed to connect our students or have them feel connected? How are they supposed to have the motivation to learn? How do they, and even if they do, how do they sustain it, right? Because again, we're putting, you know, whether we as an institution or society in general are putting these barriers in place. And that's one of the things that just, when critics talk about the snowflake generation and how entitled today's students are, it just drives me up a wall. Our students today, speaking generally, have had to overcome and continue to deal with so many more barriers in their way than any previous generation in higher education. And they're being told that it's mostly their fault too. You know, this is a generation that the, with everything that's happening, the fact that they are persisting in higher education is amazing when you think about it. So when we look at students who stop out, uh, whose, whose journey to student success has been disrupted, what are, some, what are the factors then? You know, you've identified these as well. Um, the research shows us, and again, this is nationwide, um, mostly four-year schools in the study that I'm quoting from here. Uh, but again, a lot of the things that you pointed out uh, were factors here, right? Lack of financial resources being a key one lack of college readiness. And again, note as I unveil these sort of, that's the, the top 10 factors that get in the way of student success. Note how many of them interrelate and seem to reinforce uh, and exacerbate one another, right? Because a lack of focus and motivation probably doesn't ex uh, exist in a vacuum. It's in an environment that's being fed by some of these other things, right? Language, fear, anxiety, lack of self-confidence, uh, you know, I saw some discussion in the chat of, you know, the fixed mindset. Absolutely. Students are often told a story about themselves as learners that inculcates that fixed mindset within them. And that is a really hard story to undo because it has become part of their own sense of who they are academically. And so when we look at these factors here, how many of them are, you know, urgent issues for students right now? 
And again, going into equity as well, if we highlight the bottom six here, uh, Dolabom's research from 2016 shows us or, or, or demonstrates pretty clearly that for African American students, the, the factors that I've highlighted here uh, are factors that have a statistically significant uh, difference in terms of intensity towards preventing academic success. In other words, that these are the key barriers. Uh, so question of you know, miscommunication. Uh, one of the, you know, there's a couple different things in the study when we talk about miscommunication. The primary one is that students are not able to, you know, sort of connect wires with the resources that they need. So when instructors send emails to students and students aren't checking emails, or when a student's native language is in English and they have difficulty navigating the syllabus, those sorts of structural communication issues are what the study refers to as miscommunication. But a good question. But again, thinking about what is it that we're saying to our students beyond just the literal sense of talking with them. Several of you pointed out that learning disabilities uh, were an important part of the story as well. Uh, and again, these are pre-COVID statistics, uh, but the trend was certainly uh, discernible even before the pandemic. Uh, 11.4% of the students who entered college full-time uh, in the fall of 2017 had self-reported being diagnosed with a learning disability. But what we know about the diagnosis and what we know about our lack of knowledge from learning disabilities is that this number, the actual number of students with a learning disability is, is probably significantly larger. But it's these other two realities that are really important ones for us in higher education to really wrap our heads around, right? 94% of students with documented learning disabilities received the assistance that they needed in high school. 17% of them receive it in college. And so we have to ask ourselves, you know, why is there this stunning disparity? How do we explain that? Do students know that they can and perhaps should avail themselves of the resources that our institutions, both by the force of law, but our own ethic, provide for students who need that, right? And so going back to this idea of miscommunication, you know, I think this is one of the areas where we see that uh, in operation. Uh, yes, and then chat here, they have to self-initiate to get help in college, absolutely. Uh, and even, you know, an institution like mine, I think we pride ourselves here on being very sort of forthright and forward with students, you know, maybe a lot more interventionist than other places that I've been. But even for us, this is what we struggle with, right? How do we make it a, a process that isn't solely dependent on the student's self-initiation to get the resources that they need? And again, given the numbers and the trends, you know, this is not going away. This is going to be an increasingly bigger part of our work. So one of the most important things then that students bring with them, that our students are bringing with them, is what Walton and Cohen called belonging uncertainty. Uh, you know, in graduate school, uh, for those of you know, when we went through our graduate programs, graduate school does one thing really well, and that's inculcate a really good case of imposter syndrome. Uh, and so I think a lot of us might even have personal experience with what Walton and Cohen here call belonging uncertainty, right? Do people like me? who are like I am with the stuff that I've got, do they belong in higher education? Do they belong in college? How many of our students, when they went to their high school guidance counselor to say, it's, you know, I need to start thinking about applying to college and the high school guidance counselor said, have you thought about HVAC school or welding or truck driving? Uh, how many of, you know, or cosmetology, right? How many of our students, especially first generation students, come into this higher educational landscape and are confronted with terms like bursar and syllabus and registrar that they haven't heard before and somehow seem like they're expected to know, right? Have you ever had that sinking feeling in a situation where it seems like everybody around you was handed the instruction manual and you missed it, right? That's kind of how I felt for a lot of college. So if you play video games, are, have you ever been in the situation where it feels like everybody you're playing has the cheat codes except for you, right? That's what belonging uncertainty in this sense uh, gets at. Students often come to us having framed a hypothesis that people like me do not belong here. 
But as the psychologists tell us, you know, confirmation bias is a thing, right? And so students will be looking for evidence to support that hypothesis, perhaps subconsciously, but that's what they're going to be prioritizing. That's what they're going to be honed in on. And the problem that we have to wrestle with is that students who have framed that hypothesis and are looking for that evidence to support it usually find it. Usually find it. And so let's look at one way in which students might see that in the area that we're most familiar with, academic affairs and teaching and learning. So ask yourself the question right now, who creates knowledge in your particular field? So I want you to think, for example, you know, what's the newest research? You know, the book that just won the prize, the article that everybody's talking about, you know, the listserv is all a flutter about X. Uh, who wrote the best textbook? Uh, who's doing kind of cutting edge stuff? Who's crossed over into kind of popular media out of your field or discipline? Who creates the knowledge in your field? So think about, you know, who are those people? Who are those scholars? And so I'm thinking as a historian of primarily the 19th century United States and Latin America, right? Where is the really cool kind of interdisciplinary scholarship? Uh, where are the, the creators of this knowledge institutionally? Who are they? What do they look like? And so who creates knowledge in our fields? And so having a sort of answer to that in our head, now put yourself in the situation where if you only had the syllabus for a hundred level course in your program, you know, the survey course, the intro to blank course, who would you think the knowledge producers are in your field if all you had to work on was the syllabus? Would the answers to these two questions be the same? Is what we are using to introduce students into our disciplines, the gateways into our fields, do students see themselves as knowledge creators? Do they see people like them, people from similar circumstances or people of similar appearance or backgrounds or at least adjacent cultural resonance? Do students see people who resonate with them as knowledge creators in our field? And if not, why not? Because we tell our students, and I'll use my discipline of history as an example. You know, I tell my students when they take my intro to history classes, and that's my teaching load is our survey courses. I teach our hundred level, uh, many of our hundred level courses. And this is a really important question for students who are taking these courses, not because they want to become history majors, although I do try to turn them to the dark side that way. Uh, I rarely succeed, but because, you know, history is important right, as part of our core curriculum. And that's why they're taking it. They're taking it to check a box, right? And so if I tell my students, like, look, you know, in this course, we are historians. We are doing history. Uh, I don't want you to just sort of memorize names and dates. We're going to investigate. We're going to interrogate. We're going to try to reconcile conflicting interpretations. We are going to do historical analysis. And yeah, that's some cognitive heavy lifting, but it's much more interesting and dare I say it, even fun, because you can be a historian, right? You can contribute to the knowledge in this field. You can, and I want you, you know, in terms of should, be part of this scholarly conversation in this class. But then if the students in this class don't, you know, if all my books are authored by old tenured white dudes wearing bow ties, Right, think about the historical documentaries that you watch sometimes. Like there's a running joke in my field that all those talking heads in the historical documentaries look the same, right? Old white dude, shirt, tie, glasses, right? Do my students see themselves as a knowledge producer? The cutting edge scholarship in my field, yeah, they should because there are a diverse array of scholars doing really interesting things. And you know, how can I bring that into my class to show that to my students? Because if I'm telling them that they can be a part and in fact should be a part of this scholarly conversation and they don't see themselves anywhere in that conversation, there is a dissonance. There is a misalignment between what I am saying and what I am doing. And some students will be marginalized as a result. Now, I am not saying you should have a quota system and aside, you know, textbooks based on solely racial categories for example, 
But what I am saying is that we often just sort of reproduce reading lists and course material lists without really thinking about who, who the scholars are that have produced that and who our students see as knowledge creators. And so I invite you to do that kind of examination, right? Are all the knowledge creators you are showing to your students very similar to one another, or do they really reflect the intellectual and actual diversity of your discipline? Who's in the videos? What names are you using in the case studies? What scenarios are you using? Who wrote the textbook? Who wrote the articles? If you're using primary source material, you know, who, what are the subjects of those things, right? What is your, who are the knowledge producers in your field? And so what we're going to do now is I'm going to take, uh, you know, we've been going for a while here, even though I skipped out on you for a couple of minutes. We're going to take a little bit of a recess, uh, about a 10 minute break, because zooming for three hours is something that nobody should be forced to do against their will. Uh, so we're going to take about 10 minutes. And when we come back, we'll gather here in this Zoom space. Um, and I'm going to give you a few questions uh, that pertain to a document, a Google Doc, that is at this link right here. And I will leave this slide up with the link when we go on break. You don't have to pull up the document when we take a little bit of break. But when we come back from break, you pull it up and take a look at it. And I'm going to send you into breakout rooms and the small group discussions with a question or two that I want you to think about based upon this particular document that you're gonna look at, okay? So if you want, you can go to that link now or you can you know, pull it up when you want, uh, when you come back. By my watch, I've got 2.22 in the afternoon. So let's say if, you know, at about 2.32, if we could be back in this Zoom space together, um, I'll sort of set up what it is I want you to think and talk about a little bit, and then we'll assign folks into breakout rooms in Zoom. And you'll get to experience what that looks like if that's a, a technique that you may want to use with your students as well. Okay, so let's take about 10 minutes and I'll see you back in this space then. <laughs> 